mild flu, uh, but uh, not COVID. Luckily, uh, uh, okay. surviving. Okay, guys, uh, can you just drop a quick message in the chat box if like uh, Mithun is clearly audible to everyone? And so for me, please, before we start. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, before we don't like start uh, this session, I would like to request, uh, you know, like uh, take note of a few uh, basic uh, rules which we would like to follow here. First thing is like, uh, keep yourself on mute when the uh, when the discussion is going on, while you are uh, asking a question or you want to be a part of the discussion happening, and whenever you are trying to, you know, ask the question to Mithun or, or the or the guest over here, so please, if the bandwidth allows, try to, you know, uh, keep your video on so that uh, it adds to uh, the the value. So, uh, so shall we start, Mithun? If you are ready, yeah, yeah. let's go for it. Yeah, so uh, welcome everyone to this uh, full session of uh, Startup Talks of VNIT series. And uh, today we have with us uh, a 2005 graduate of VNIT, Mithal Srivatsa. He is basically a mechanical engineer who has been uh, working uh, in corporate with uh, logistic companies like APM, Musk, and uh, Cummins. Uh, then he one day he thought like I'm being the active user of e-commerce services. So why not be the service provider rather than just the buyer? And then uh, he thought of an idea called Blowhorn. And today he is uh, growing at 350 plus employees with the exhaustive coverage in uh, 100 plus cities, covering almost 25% of pin codes in India. So uh, why don't you just try to narrate your story from VNIT or even before that, if you want to, like how your entrepreneurial uh, spirit tried to grow or like when this idea hit that you should be an entrepreneur than just a corporate home show. Well, uh, I think I think who you are as a person is defined by uh, being honest about your insecurities. And uh, uh, I think uh, that is what defines your journey, right? So let's say you had, uh, uh, Let's say you had parents who were like really tough on you as a child when you had to study and you would rebel against them, right? So there's a lot of things which goes back to childhood and how things were in childhood. Luckily for me, in my case, I had, uh, I had a very healthy, decent childhood and where I was encouraged to do what I wanted. Nobody came in my way. Uh, so one of the key things, uh, at least in school for me, was uh, uh, there, there was jealousy. Right. So growing up. So when I saw when I saw other kids wearing good shoes and I didn't have a good shoe, I was like, what the hell? You know, there, there's no way. Force 10 and from Lakani was like, you know, hot shit way back. And uh, so I think I think that was something. And then, you know, there was a stamp collection club in school and there was a small bank in the school which was run by the students. And, and you know, like then, you know, like you connect the dots and you say, OK, you put some money in the bank then buy stamps. And then sell stamps at profit, and then you know make money, and so on and so forth. So that was interesting. I think that was my first foray into like making. So the whole goal was predicated upon two things, right? One was to get an Indiglo watch, which back then I thought was like something sent from heavens, right? So the tech was like so awesome for me that the whole dial could light up. Uh, I was I was mind blown, right? So. These two things were, and the four strand shoes were the things I wanted. And I got them within like nine months of like buying and selling postal stamps. So that was my first taste into kind of dealing with that. So jealousy started that off initially. And that gave me some confidence. The other things, the other insecurities were that, uh, what, what if you're unproductive, right? So being unproductive was like really terrible for me. I wanted to learn a trade, right? <laughs> So uh, I had an aunt's uh, printing press and I would go and work in a printing press on holidays. It was not like child labor or anything. I would go voluntarily. I would enjoy working. And uh, yeah, so these were some of the experiences growing up, I feel, which came around the insecurities you have as a person, which kind of made you an entrepreneur. In VNIT, I did one or two things, which I don't want to talk to you in detail about, uh, because let it stay the way it is. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so making money, what I realized is possible. 
but what vnit did for me i mean sadly was um, or maybe it kind of addressed a bunch of my insecurities uh, i don't know wh- why it did that but i just decided to pursue a normal job after vnit right so i think that is what changed me a little and when i keep thinking about why that is the case and uh, i think it's an ecosystem issue where a lot of my colleagues were looking at normal jobs and i didn't have anybody in in the in the group say hey you know what i want to go and build something right very few of them and most people who wanted to build something had family family businesses and so this was the so this was the pre trajectory and what happened in vnit maybe i thought okay there's no point being the black sheep and you know like let's pursue you know let's just get a job that's the whole point of coming here and uh, so yeah i think i think tracks changed in vnit okay so uh, if you could uh, like what what age was this when you like you know did the did the stamp thing to the four stain shoes like how old i was 14 15 14 Okay, I mean, so I was at uh, uh, some at some business around MP3 music, right? Uh, made made a little money because for me back then I wanted to buy a phone which which had the Tetris in it, right? So that was important for me. And there was only the Moto uh, Motorola uh, phone which had Tetris, and uh, Nokia phones had Snake back then. So it was the requirements were so basic growing up. I think. Uh, and once you hit that goal right there was no motivation because it was a material goal yeah correct and that's the key difference you know as you get older and as you get wiser possibly you figure out that yeah yeah other so, so like you had an enterprising streak when you were a student but it was more material then we in it kind of tried to i would say institutionalize you for a corporate job and uh, nine good years you spent in corporate i think it's for good only but then in 2014 like you started your enterprising streak again for a cause now not not for something which is material so exactly. so uh, can you tell like uh, was vnit or the corporate experience what you had for full 9 years was it instrumental for you to change your vision from material needs to something visionary or something for a cause no this uh... So yeah, see, life life is all about serendipity and the events that happen to you, right? So that's what makes you as a person. The choices you make define you, right? So I joined Cummins, and uh, see, what is a mechanical engineer's dream? It's to work on the assembly line, right? I joined Cummins, and within five months, uh, I mean, the first two months I was mighty impressed, right? They gave you a uniform. You didn't have to spend on clothes. They gave you a pair of shoes. I was like, wow, this is good. and then you know the food was mind blowing in the pune campus the food was excellent the people were nice there they were genuinely nice managers and what not there's a lot to learn if you were into that kind of a thing but for me i was not into that kind of thing and i realized that in 5 months and uh, i couldn't see myself for 20 years working in the same campus no that was not me right so I think uh, again, you know, just sheer good luck. I was preparing for CAT, and you know, like I saw some newspaper. I was uh, I was in Pune, so I was eating at this place called Pargukhi. I think it's still there. I think they've changed the location. Uh, this is not your American Burger King. It's the whole Indian Irani Burger King place, right? And there, I saw in the newspaper clipping. I think I saw uh, a call for uh, walk-in walk-in interviews for Musk. so i went and did a walk in interview for musk and they were recruiting for a fast track management program and then you know applied and then got in and uh, once i got in uh, i wanted to kind of learn the trade as much as i could right because for once i had actually latched on to something interesting and see this was a fast track management program and they treated you well so they would they would take you to Uh, they would rather ship you to copenhagen every six months they would train you there with the best of the best uh, i mean everything from how to hold a fork to how to negotiate to how to kind of uh, to get a balance sheet was taught so it was like a mini mba in many many ways right so one of the first things that we had in the first module was we had this guy called oscar rosendahl who was the head of hr come and speak to us i mean imagine 
uh, you're all sitting in the opera house in copenhagen uh, you're just average age is 22 23 and you're all like then he comes and he does a long speech about why we are like important for musk's growth uh, and uh, he he came and he said one sentence which is um, with talent born by duty born so he said if you are good at something you better kind of uh, execute on that uh, no matter what right so so then the next seven years became a question of what am I good at, really? Right. So that that discovery started, and Musk was like the ideal launch. It was the ideal launch pad because see, you had multiple roles in multiple locations. You started off in operations, sales, whatever, right? Customer service. Then you went to the sports industry. Then you know. So I went across a wide spectrum of businesses and uh, different uh, experiences over seven years. So then I could pick up. My main conclusion was. I was moderately good at everything. <laughs> I was not mind blowing at anything. So I was a generalist, right? So now again, the key decision now is if you're a generalist or a specialist, right? So specialists in my, in my worldview, like an artist or a surgeon, right? So if you look at their career path, it's mostly flat because see, even for a surgeon, I think they spent 34, 35 years just studying, right? So most of them actually get into active practice at 31, 32. And then they need 10 years to establish their repute. And then, you know, like basically in the last 20% of the career, they make most of their money. That's how specialists, like if you look at MF Hussein, you know, he was spending on the streets and suddenly he was earning five crores per painting. So I, I think that's the specialist part. Now, if you're, if you're a really good engineer, you want to do a PhD, excellent. So be a specialist, right? You're a really good doctor. Excellent. Go be a specialist. If you're a generalist like me, who is moderately good at many things, uh, I think the way for a generalist is the, the curve is linear because you kind of go on the salary curve, 10% growth, just above inflation and all that. But here, if you really have to kind of do a step function and you want to grow faster, I think the only way for that is to kind of take a little bit of extra risk, right? So there are three levels of risk, right? So you can either join... Uh, you can you can either go to a foreign country and you can work there and you can make some money. But what I quickly realized was uh, you won't be able to save much without compromising on quality of life abroad. In fact, you will save a lot more in India if you consider the same quality of life, right? So that was a useless idea for me. The second way you could kind of think of if you had to kind of accumulate wealth so that you'll have optionality in, in, the, in your future to do what you want. Uh, the second thing you could have done was uh, you could have joined somebody else's endeavor, which was very risky. And back then, there were a lot of VNIP entrepreneurs trying different things in Nagpur itself, right? So we had, uh, we had a couple of seniors who were in the uh, hospitality business, and they were exporting and importing rice to China and whatnot. Uh, so there's, there's this guy called Sandeep Vakmare. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So... For me, I used to tell him, dude, I'm willing to quit my job and come join you. You know, let's scale this up. Let's see what, what is possible, right? And he was like, yeah, yeah, give me a year. Let this scale up a little. Then I'll be able to, you know, like take in more people and all that. So after a while, I was enthusiastic to kind of join somebody else's high-risk proposition and see if I can scale it up because I didn't have any passion project of my own. And then you come to the third piece where you build your own passion project. So these are the only three ways I think you can really... I, I think there are literally two ways where you can really make a ton of money. And uh, yeah, so that is without compromising on quality of life in some way, right? So at least you're with your parents in India, uh, you're kind of, uh, you're with your friends and you know, you're know you enjoying your idlis and dosas and whatnot. So I thought this was a pretty good uh, thing to do. So post my MBA, uh, which I completed in the UK, uh, I didn't waste any time. I came back to India to build something. So there was some clarity of thought on how we should proceed from a career perspective. And, and this is what I chose. And again, I chose to stick to my key strength, which was I'd spent seven and a half years in logistics. Oh. I saw something for Bharat. I had to solve something that I knew. And what did I know? I knew logistics. So I decided to take on the toughest logistics problem, which is last mile logistics. Now... Most people tend to focus on the largest stand, 
because it helps them fundraise faster. So what is a larger TAM? It's intercity trucking, right? So it's 10, 10 times, 11 times bigger than this. So obviously they raise hundreds of millions, right? But this is a smaller thing. Most people don't understand it. So it's a very interesting space from a, from a pure execution standpoint. Uh, but I, I, think, I think what has kept me going, I mean, we have been around for six years now, is the fact that uh, I started this because I thought I could solve the problem. And it all goes back to that day at module one in Copenhagen, where the guy said, uh, with talent bound by duty bound. And then came the discovery of talent. Like, where am I good at? And then discovering that I'm not good at anything specifically, right? I'm, I'm moderately good at many things, not very good at anything, right? And then coming to the realization that as a generalist, you have to be an entrepreneur to make uh, some impact in your life if you want to have optionality in your future where you can choose what you want to do. And that is the part. Yeah. So basically, I, I would say that you are being very humble by saying like you are not very good at many things and moderately good because you're running an enterprise which is immensely successful in five years of time. You are like uh, feeding 400 families, I think, and do, doing good, helping yeah. solve a problem for the industry. So basically, you must be good at moderately very, very good at, at so many things. So uh, with that, I'll like to ask one thing, like how this idea, like when you work with uh, Musk or I would say APM, from you know, like bulk handling kind of thing to small ticket things of you know, like uh, intercity stuff. So, how how does that thought occur to you? One thing you just said that like uh, because logistics experience you had, you could solve the problem. But how how did that idea came that in logistics particularly, I want to address this problem or this? So when I came back from India, uh, in between I had to kind of make some money. Uh, so I took up a consulting job with Walmart Labs for three months. Um, and I was uh, having my chai tapri chai, you know, in the afternoon, and the VNIT uh, pickup. Otherwise that nobody, there's no, there's no chai tapri culture in Bangalore where I grew up, right, as a, as a kid. So this was interesting, something I picked up in VNIT. Having my afternoon chai and I was, uh, the office was on outer ring road and I was counting how many Merus were passing every minute, right? Then what I found was there were more Tata Aces going than Merus. And uh, I never paid attention to that. See, the thing is, uh, what defines you as a person is, uh, I feel I was rather stupid. As a logistician, I should have figured that out, that there's so many Merus going. But you always have blind spots, you know? Because if you're an international logistician, you're looking at filling up a ship. You don't care about having a small truck somewhere in the city, right? But I think just, just sitting and doing nothing and just observing, <laughs> I think I realized, oh, shit, there are a lot of Tata Aces going in the city. So let, yeah. let us see the time. What are they servicing? Then I saw, oh, shit, okay, this is a big market. Nobody's focused on intra-city, and this is what is keeping Bharat backwards. So... If you, if you think of India, right? Um, see, India has a much more smaller, literally flatter space with uh, railway lines, which are almost the length of China's, right? Literally the length of China's. It's, we, have, we have the infrastructure somewhat, and we are a peninsular country. So we, we have like access to uh, short coast lines. Yes. Still, you know, like our, <laughs> Logistics cost is 14% of our GDP. Mm -hmm. So if you if you take if you take a developed country uh, like a Germany or a US, logistics cost is 8% of the GDP. So then you kind of get down to okay, should, where is India's logistics cost being spent? Where is most of the money going for for a good being moved from anywhere to anywhere? 40 to 50% of the logistics cost is going out in the last month. It comes to the city and from the city to the house or from the warehouse to your house, that is where things are getting screwed up, right? Uh, and that is that is the key thing. And that is something that I thought, okay, this is worth solving because even if we can bring in some percentage efficiency here, we'll move Bharat forward by a few BP bits, right? So a few basis points on the GDP. I think I think that that was driving us also, right? So 
And then, you know, we looked at, okay, how to solve this at scale. Uh, there were two things happening. People were getting onto Android tech very quickly in 2013, 2014. And uh, Uber had just started as a concept. And in India, I mean, in the US, it was already over. In India, it had just started. And so for me, what was interesting was, okay, all these things are happening. So how can we leverage this to kind of do something in logistics? It's not, it's not a mind blowing idea, right? So it's a pretty simple idea. It's just uh -huh. over working. Uh -huh. See, India is also a very, India is a market where the barriers of entry, if the, if the business, if they're low, which is true for most marketplace businesses, um, you'll have a lot of clones overnight. Uh -huh. So I think within six months, we had close to 140 competitors. In a month. 140 comp competing companies in the same space, right? So it was, it was, a, it was a funny time, uh, you know, like because we had built this business with the pursuit of solving the problems, because we built this business thinking, we have to keep the company on, right? We had built the business uh, with the technology first approach. We have taken a lot of these calls from uh -huh. these things helped us out. Okay. And uh, in terms of like ticket size, if you see the Mux ticket size versus what you are handling right now, the ticket size. So uh, how did you fill that gap of your experience or expertise? Did you find the right partner or like you hired the right people? So what was the thought process when you made this transition? So I think, um, I think, like I told you, I'm genuinely moderately skilled at uh, doing other things, right? But one skill I have is the ability to get people together on a project. Hello. So Hello. I, think, I think getting the ability to have get people onto a project was something that I had when I was younger. Uh, so I leveraged that. And I think that is something. See, Lohan is not Mithun, right? So. I took the first risk. Yes, I built the first concept, the first business model. And from then on, like, it's an operational businessman with a, with a strong technology layer involved. So there are so many people contributing every day, right? So uh -huh. I've just been fortunate to kind of have the kind of core team that I wanted initially who kind of helped us out, kind of get us from zero to one. Uh -huh. And then on, it's been, you know, like, through hits and misses, right? So it's not like, you know, we learned everything from day one. We made so many mistakes in hiring and this, that, etc. Over time, I think now after five years, six years of doing this, now we have perfected at least certain things, but we are still, I think, I think being in a constant state of imperfection makes you feel like an like underdog and makes you kind of work harder. Yeah. And I think that is what we do, right? So. And I agree. They say perfection is the enemy of progress. So yeah. If you want to improve, you need to have some scope of improvement all the time. So uh, one one question from you know like uh, uh, like for, on my personal curiosity, like uh, you are uh, like contributing to a part of supply chain or value chain as we call it. No. So uh, did you realize? And if you did, <clears throat> when did you realize that uh, beyond the supply chain or value chain, there is an ecosystem which also needs to be there? for a business or enterprise to be successful? And if so, what in your business was the key influencer or regulatory norm which kind of helped you accelerate your growth? So I think, I think um, see for me, I think I was reading one of Ron Conway's books or some somebody's or uh, Paul Graham's essays. Titan? I'm sorry. The, the Titan about John D. Rockefeller? Ron Conway, uh, I don't remember, I think it's something, it had the word startup in it, the title. And there were some essays by Paul Graham, I was reading them uh, before I started all this, right? See, one of the key things I realized was most startups fail because of, you know, other than things which are in your control, like having a team or fundraising, not even fundraising, maybe not in your control. But one of the key things is timing, you know, timing seems to be a big this thing for a lot of startups. And what is timing, right? So if you are a two-sided marketplace, you have the supply side and demand side. You have to figure out whether both sides are mature. Now, for example, if you want to 3D different houses today, but the demand side doesn't want to use it, but the technology is mature, there is technology available, but nobody wants to use it. 
There's no point. There's no business sense in that, correct? I agree. So the key thing is to time the maturity of the supply side and the demand side. Uh -huh. And we did it well. And uh, we did it very well, right? So we, we kind of knew where the market, so we created a 10 year plan of what all things will happen. So if this comes in, let's say transportation becomes more efficient, what is the next layer which will come in? If that becomes more efficient, what will come in? So when will autonomy come in? When will drones come in, right? Mm -hmm. So we had a plan which we built across 10 years and we would every year we would sit and evaluate what has happened on the demand side, what has happened on the supply side, have the customers behaved the way we wanted. So we would learn and we would change the model and more or less we were right with 70, 80% right, which is good enough for a five year, 10 year predictive model, right? Uh -huh. The key thing is also like the other thing which I think people need to be aware of is to start in India, unless you're in B2C company, it's easy to kind of fundraise. And most companies are easy to fundraise initially. But later on, to get into a nuanced fundraise position, I think you need investors who have adherence to a specific thesis, right? So India is, so that that for me is something I think the ecosystem needs to evolve a bit. Uh, I think to have niche investors uh, looking at sectors and segments. And right now, I think we have got that. So we have got an agri uh, investor, we have got just a consumer investor who looks only at consumer brands. So I think things are getting exciting now. So uh, I think the key thing which we didn't evaluate well was the maturity of the investment community. Right? Uh -huh. so that is something we should have evaluated, right? So if we did the five forces or something, and then we looked at the maturity of all the pieces there, then we should have done that. Um, See, now if you're selling a vegan ice cream uh, for kids, right, with low sugar, see, I would buy that, right? See, as a VC, I'm like, yeah, I have kids. Oh, yeah, I think uh, they shouldn't be drinking too much milk. It's not good for them. They'll become lactose intolerant anyway. Oh, yeah, you know, they like ice cream. So it connects immediately, right? So when you're selling a consumer brand, right, it's easy. Mm. But when you're selling something like, oh, why are you here? Oh, Bharat is here, you know, 14% GDP oh, is spent on logistics. We need to reduce a few bips by making this efficient. And then, you know, this is how we make efficient. And yeah. by the time we get to a story, they're yawning and they're like, okay, yeah, what, yeah. what's up? You know? it's, it's a classic problem of B2B. Yeah. Classic problem of B2B. So that is one of the things, right? So does it mean... I think, I think we have to take the blame on ourselves as founders also, that we need to really simplify the business and kind of explain it to the right, this thing. So there are, there are things, I just feel that India in the next four to five years will be the most amazing place to kind of build because uh, you have a bunch of founders backing funds now. Uh, you have founder friendly funds coming up. You have terms which are getting friendlier. You have like boom rounds. You have unicorns being created at a rapid clip. These are all good signs for India. I think it, these are exciting times to be building here. But the most important thing, uh, Upkar, which I think is wise, and you pointed this out, uh, which nobody considers, nobody's asked me till date, is what do you think about what to build and how do you think about market maturity? And that's very important, right? So understanding both the demand side and the supply side. If these two things are a go, if your unit economics are fine, and you are near profitable, you will survive. Um, right? Now, whether there's external money or not, it doesn't matter. Correct. So that is the thing, right? Now, if you want to start space, space tech in 2014, people would have laughed at you. Now, if you start space tech after what SpaceX has done, people will be like, okay, take my money, right? So this is interesting. So that's the thing, right? So weirdly, you have to balance out both the demand side and the supply side. And the third key piece is the investment side of it. That is also something you have to evaluate, which I didn't do well, but it's all getting corrected now. We are lucky to have the investors we have and uh, moving on. So that's, that's that. So uh, like we spoke about the difference between the B2B and B2C and the nuances of understanding the difference to the people who are trying to be the stakeholders. So. Uh, when you started in 2014, and by the time, as you said, like Ola was already there, Uber was relatively new, but established in US. So does that help you to establish a proof of concept to your uh, 
prospect with customers or value chain partners when you started out to sell this concept? See, the thing is, I found two sorts of investors, right? So I found, I mean, to be brutal, mature investors don't invest on the idea. They invest on the person. Like we are. Yeah, and they don't care about, oh, they always believe that something will pivot. But you know what? My money will be safe. This guy will figure, figure a way out, right? The newbie investors, what I've seen, uh, I've seen that they invest on the idea. So the idea really doesn't have much credence. Yeah, execution right? and... Initially, the first check will always be on, okay, can I trust this guy to be safe with my money? Or at least execute on what he has promised. Or at least, okay, he'll go somewhere. And like uh, the same thing, like when you try to uh, get in your partners, the value chain partners, the maybe the fleet companies or the local logistic companies. So did the proven concept of Ola and Uber help you in a certain way to you know, sell this idea to them? Absolutely. See, when I had to go to the driver community, I think telling them that, hey, you know what? Have you seen guys in Ola and Uber with the phones? And all? We are making the same thing for you. And they were like, yeah, of course. They were excited. But the key thing here was, uh, see, again, the VNIT network helped here, right? So one intuition we had was that average truck driver was not English literate. Right. Now, if you're not English literate, then, you know, you have to develop a user interface which even an illiterate person could do. And we roped in, uh, at least we kind of met Indrani Mehdi, who's a VNIT alumnus, uh, who, who is possibly, you know, one of the world's leading researchers on user interfaces for the illiterate. She kind of gave us some guidance over two sessions, right? And that is how we built up the first app, right? So we leveraged the network we had, which was a VNITM, and uh, she helped us out. So these were the things, you know, all these things came together. So that was one interesting piece for us. So making an app which was really simple to use was really important. That was all interesting, actually. And uh, I think that we already have like, spent 30 minutes discussing. So uh, maybe we can open it for the question and answer sessions. So if anybody has, please uh, unmute yourself and switch on your video. Bandwidth allows and please feel free to ask me questions. Hi, Upkaran Mitha. Hey, hi. Uh, hi switch on the video. Uh, I look terrible. I haven't taken a shower because I was watching the test match. Uh, I'll try that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so Mitha. Nice background. Yeah. yeah. So, Mithun, I think one question that I have for you is, uh, uh, how did you meet uh, Nikhil, who also, uh, for the people on the call, happens to be a fellow VN19, and how did you get together? And he was a part of your team for so long. So, he was a part of the company for a long time. So, Nikhil and I were VNITNs. Uh, we were from the same association. I don't know. I don't think ASOS exists anymore uh, in the form that... The state ASOS, which we used to have in Austin. Okay. From the Karnataka Association. So we knew each other very, very intimately initially. And yeah, so that was an interesting time. And uh, Nikhil is the kind of a person who is extremely passionate in building things from zero to one. Uh, and then, you know, like, I think, I think that is something that is also interesting when the person has insight as to what they're really good at and they really enjoy building things from scratch and kind of taking it to a level. And then, you know, like the scaling piece of it is not very interesting for him. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, he decided to kind of move on to do other things, but uh, yeah. Okay. So it, it was the ASO Connect and then uh, maybe you got uh, together maybe in 2013 or 14 when you had this idea and then you wrote yeah. For marketing, we had a lot of help from Shankar, who was a brand consultant, who was again from a batch meta. Uh, we, uh, our CTO currently is Santosh Desai, again from Karnataka, so same badge. Um, we, we have a bunch of VNITMs working at different, uh, different uh, roles, so we are pretty comfortable with that. See, the key thing is when you find, when you have to find your first set of believers, when you're trying to build something right, who will believe you? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the people you would have hung out with or the people who would have worked with you at some level in the college or something like that. Those are the guys who will believe you. So that I think is important. And 
and that is that is the most important ecosystem service that vnit should provide going forward i feel helping helping founders find other co-founders and team members from within the community thanks upkar i'm done yes yes uh, anybody would like to spark it just give me a sec yeah all right Yeah, Mitan. Hi, this is Anil. Hey, Anil. How are you? How are you? How are you doing? Yeah, you're looking bright and fresh. I'm doing all right. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm fortunate to spend some time with you even before this. Yeah. Uh, so I have this question for you. On, let's say you want to start off today. Yeah. What is it that you will pick? Yeah. If I have to start off today, right? So. See again. I want to pick up like I want to pick up like big problems which have like real impact, right? So uh, two three years back, I would have said I wanted to start a bank, uh, specifically uh, focused on the unbanked or the new bank. So I just focused on building something for millennials or building something for the rural sector, right? So that is something I would have focused on. Uh, I think. currently agri tech is hot uh, blockchains are very hot in my in my in my mind right i don't know what the vc think i think uh, blockchain applications are just the tip of the iceberg i think it will literally transform a lot of things see and and if you look at india's inefficiency right it comes from bureaucracy and the bureaucracy is just oh you know you go to a you go to get your license you have to fill a form and if you are a woman you have to fill a different form if you are from somewhere else you have to fill a different form but all of this can be solved through blockchain really efficiently yeah. i think i think i think blockchain is very interesting for me um space tech is very attractive but for me it's the human equivalent of doing a fleet right so you're already moving in space i think the planet is moving in space so so calm down so that is how i think very contrary uh, i definitely tear up every time i see a space rocket go up but Space tech, I think we are we are at least another four to five years away from actually kind of making this into a commoditized service. So there'll be a lot of niche players coming in. So not that um, EVs uh, and autonomy is very very important. I feel I think that will be the next obvious thing because you have computing power which is really really cheap now, and uh, you have like local uh, processing units available. You know like. specifically on uh, specifically to do specific tasks uh, which are high power so that is interesting and of course the last thing is uh, quantum computing which is very very exciting and if you look at if you look at the if you look at some of the papers written by d wave uh, with that american company which is in quantum computing and the problems they are trying to solve it's an exciting time to be alive honestly i think this is we don't realize it but this is the roaring 20s you know keep telling that so we are very close to we have a tokamak which is a toroidal magnetic reservoir which is a essential element which keeps the plasma for a fusion reactor and it kept the plasma at some 10000 degrees for like 20 seconds just about last week right in korea so we are really close to actually trying out uh, okay where fusion will take us which means we'll have infinite energy so we are very close to kind of you know like we made a vaccine in 4 months right which is pretty amazing uh, from the scratch uh, from designing it to kind of instituting it so th- i think i think this is the roaring 20s i think there's no cause for caution there's so many opportunities available across the train but if i were to pick my favorites i would pick uh, autonomous mobility i would pick uh, blockchains i would pick uh, quantum computing um i would pick uh, some of these things and to some extent even agri you know there's a lot of things to do in agri uh, these these four sectors of things i would pick i maybe to put it in a different perspective let's say if you're in college what would you do like what what because all these things that you're telling i'm sure you've gained in so much experience now and then you can always think about this but as a student um like with with very limited background experience see the thing is uh, right now i think uh, education has become commoditized because of the internet right so 
do you really need to be in VNIT to learn fluid mechanics or can you learn it on a YouTube video? Right. Yeah, you, you can always do it otherwise. Yeah. Unfortunately, we were in this transit generation where we had just discovered the internet, but the internet was not fully accessible in the hospitals and whatnot, right? So there was specific information. So some people who had access to more information and they realized, okay, this is the way to think about life. They would kind of do better things, right? Right now, this, there's no information asymmetry as much, you know, it's really flattened out at least in terms of, you know, learning your career path and whatnot. So obviously I would be an entrepreneur fairly quickly, I think, if I had figured things out, or maybe I would work for a year or two and kind of, you know, work on, work on getting some experience below my belt. And, but it would definitely accelerate my path and my own understanding of myself, I think, definitely. Thanks, thanks for that. Sorry, man, that was a long answer. No, 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 that, that's amazing. Actually. Hey, Mithun, this is Kamlesh. Hi. Hey, Kamlesh, how are you? I am good. How are you? Long time, man. I'm not aging at all. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Mithun, just wanted to uh, talk to you on um, the investment piece that you yeah. had done very successfully. Mm -hmm. So, um, when you started in 1314, uh, right? Uh, when was the time when you decided that I would need uh, this kind of a uh, money and uh, uh, this is how I approach uh, the money problem and uh, how much stake to dilute and those kind of things. Can you share those thoughts? Sure. Um, I think I think the first thing you need to realize is uh, you need to build the business model yourself and the financial model yourself. So when you do the costing sheet, right, the usual heuristic you use is how much money do you need to survive for 18 months? at Triamond level, which is, you know, like at very basic, nobody's buying MacBooks, right? Maybe you're renting laptops and whatnot, but how, how can you survive at the basic level for 18 months? How much cash do you need, right? That is usually the, that should be the low watermark on how much you raise, okay? Now, what percentage you dilute is a very funny thing, which I discovered much later. I made a big mistake when I started. Uh, see, VCs do not care between paying you 300K or 350K or 400K. For them, that's the same amount. What they care about is what is the percentage holding that they have in the company. Okay. And usually as an individual, I would say 10% would make me happy or 15% or 20%, right? So it depends, right? So I think you need to study that market and you need to understand what percentage holding the VC wants. Okay, so if the VC has a percentage holding already in his mind, so if he wants to have 10% for let's say 350K, you cannot say, I'll give you three, give me 300K, I'll give you 8%, he won't agree to it. Okay. Okay, you say, I'll give you 300K for 10%. You understand? So the key here is you shouldn't worry too much about, you should have an idea, which is the low watermark. How much is the min of how much you need to raise? Is 18 months at a ramen level. And then you need to start off with that at 8% or 7% of your ALO, if you are raising 10%, if that's what the VC wants. And you need to do your research. Some, some seed investors need 30%. Some seed investors need 15%. Right? You need to figure that out. And then you need to kind of go and approach them. So you're saying the percentage comes before the amount uh, that you are talking about. That, I mean, VCs generally have percentage in mind and then they approach for valuation and then they decide, okay, reverse calculation wise, this much. Decide, decide. See, that's why you need to kind of reach some sort of a sensibility. Let's say you need 300K in your model. Right. Even if you buffet it, you cannot take it to 3 million. Right. If you kind of add extra cost and whatnot, you might take it to 500K, 600K, 1 million. Right. Got it. Got it. So okay. that, that is the sweet spot. That is the dance that you need to do. So I did it the other way. I would say, oh, you know, oh, you're going to give this much or but this much percentage, I take this much and all that. So okay. that was stupid when I started off. So I, I suggest, you know, like going forward, people don't. Great. Uh, second, one more question. So yeah. how did you convince Santosh to come on board? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I think 
even for the women I've loved in my life, I haven't had to convince that hard for them to kind of love me back. Like, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it was like years of uh, constant, uh, dude, like, uh, are you interested? Hey, we are building, come, we are building, come, we are building, come, we are building, come. And then he agreed, right? So uh, to give him credit, right? So he took a big risk and then he came on board. And I think he saw the potential in what we were building because he was working at JDS Software, which is the world leader in supply chain software. So okay. he kind of got that, and you know, like, luckily, you know, the stars came together. I would say. I think I think he's an amazing guy to have on the team. The team loves him. So yeah, you guys know him quite well. So yeah, yeah, yeah we know him. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Nikhil. Great talking to you. Hey, uh, Mithun, uh, this is Karthik. So, couple of questions. See, everyone talks about what were the reasons behind your success or something. I'm actually interested in uh, things, you know. Can you tell us three mistakes that you would want uh, new budding entrepreneurs to avoid? Because most of the times, it's the mistakes that cost you a lot. I mean, sometimes it's just uh, points beyond your control that might make you successful. But uh, you can actually, uh, in my uh, experience, I figured out you can actually put fingers on your mistakes fairly easily. And unfortunately, nobody talks a lot about those things. So here in this forum, I would just want you to shed some light on this so that, you know, what are the three, four big no-nos uh, that you have experienced that you would advise uh, new entrepreneurs? New entrepreneurs, right? See, um, see, I don't think I'm some oracle in this. I think, let me take some uh, interesting things from Y Combinator, right? So we actually got into Y Combinator, but we didn't join. Uh, so some things we learned from YC was that it's important to have a co-founder. So if you cannot convince one more person to join your journey, how will you convince 100 people more to join your journey? So that is the important signal I feel. Uh, the second most important is generally one of you should be technical. See, you cannot just say, oh, he will do customer service, I'll do sales, I'm very good at talking. Sorry, boss, it's like, I'm not going to put my money beyond that, right? So, so that, is, that is, I think having a technical co-founder is kind of important, one of them, right? Again, YC learnings, not my learnings. Um, I, think, I think the other piece which I see is these are all nice to have, right? So everybody, there can be exceptions to every rule. This is not like an absolute rule also. That is also the YC disclaimer. Because if you look at Airbnb, both the founders, co-founders were designers and whatnot. Um, and one personal thing I would tell you all is uh, the thing I just told uh, Kamlesh is don't get fixated on how much percentage, right? Fixate on maximizing how much money you can raise from the VC because you will have to give up some percentage of the company anyway, unless you are born to a millionaire and whatnot, or you have like a trust fund. See, if you have to build a high risk business, risk capital, you will have to be willing to kind of be pragmatic about these things, right? So I think, I think focus on maximization of the investment rather than how much dilution. So in terms of our mistakes, you want to know our mistakes, dude, like every day we make mistakes. Yes. We start, right? So this is like mistake central, right? Startups. Uh, because see, there's no, there's no real, no, there's no playbook, right? Every startup is very contextual. It's just like, I was discussing with one of my friends, it's like bringing up a child, right? There's no playbook. Nobody's told you, oh, you know what? Okay, once you change diapers, yeah, you got to feed this and do that. And every child is its own entity, right? right. I think that is the key thing here. So we do a ton of mistakes. The mistakes you should avoid are uh, you should never hire because you have to fill the role. You shouldn't. You should always hire properly. You should be really. Uh, I think the other thing is most people don't value. Uh, see, most people think the hustle means that you'll say whatever the fuck you want and you can kind of do whatever you want, right? That's not the way it works, right? See, end of the day, your name matters and your reputation matters in the market. Right? It's important you keep your word. Hustle doesn't mean you go around, you know, cheating your vendors and doing something. Right? So these are all these are all some of the things I've seen a lot of people do because they think that's the way to do it, and I don't think that's the case. Uh, learning to sell is a very important skill for a founder. Now, whether 
you're an introvert, you're an ambivert, whether you're good at it, you're bad at it. I think that is something that's important, uh, especially if you have to raise money from in the future rounds, right? As you kind of raise later rounds, it's very important. So I think these are all the things which I learned through many mistakes, right? I, I was terrible at pitching. I was like, uh, my pitch decks were shit. Like investors would say, what the hell is this? You know, I'm like one investor came and said, nobody trained you to pitch. You just came here just like that. What is this? You're going all over the place. No, I don't have time for it. He walked out, dude. Like it was shocking for me when I was raising CC round. I was like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, Tim Draper's invested. Okay, let's look. Oh, Indian investor investing. Okay, we, we got lucky a little during the seed round. CD say when I was actually fundraising, I was like, I got shat on by the first investor I pitched, right? So, yeah, a lot of things to learn. So, we keep learning. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think the technology, you should never compromise. That is also one thing. So, many people think that, see, even if you are like in the agri business or in the business which you intuitively think technology won't make sense, it doesn't matter. You still need to kind of build efficiencies using tech. I mean, a tech first approach to things is important. So that's 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 some nuggets, dude. Yeah, thank you. Really? Yeah, helpful. yeah hi, Mathun. Yeah. Hey, hi. Yeah, hi, Madhu. So, uh, Mathun, like, we are also planning to raise seed round. So, I just want to understand, like, what all metrics, like, you created, like, your model was validated. What was that case? And how many yeah, customers you have were, to, uh, to this question, right? So without knowing the details of your company, I won't be able yeah. to help, right? And we don't have the time for that. So what I'll do is I'll drop okay. my email in the chat. Okay. We'll coordinate separately for this. On the, on the same point, like uh, as we are, you know, like on the back end of this uh, session. Yeah. So uh, <clears throat> if uh, there are no further questions for the group, you know, like I would like to... Uh, ask one question to Mithun, like first thing first, you know, I'm very grateful and congratulations to you for. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so uh, what I'm saying is first thing, uh, I want to congratulate you and also want to express my gratitude that, you know, you have fellow NITNs in your core team and, you know, you always, you know, uh, like gave them the first right of refusal, if I should say. So uh, with that, but I, I have, you know, a grave concern about, you know, like entrepreneurship and VNIT, like uh, why we have, you know, like one Mithun every batch or one Akshat every batch or one LND Rosario or one Bhushan, like uh, what do you think, like uh, why, why we are tier two, if I may say, institute who produces on, on entrepreneurs and like if we compare it with like likes of IITs and ISCs, you know, they just raise 100 crores, like by fellowships and scholarships. So, so what do you think that needs to change in the uh, fiber of VNIT to you know get us to that that level? See, first of all, I think whenever you're doing something like this, you need to have a vision, or you need to at least have the right intentions. You need to have one of these two things, right? So, if you're a visionary leader, or even if you're a visionary student who wants to build something, you can always start clubs and whatnot, and you can really make this and take this up, right? In fact, we have one of the top entrepreneurs, Shashi Khan Chaudhary, uh, right? In Nagpur, who is an amazing, uh, so approachable, so down to earth, and he gives some excellent insights into the business. Every time I go to Nagpur, I meet him, right? Uh, so we have, we have a good ecosystem of people. What we don't have is, uh, I think, if you think about, let's be honest about VNIT, right? See, for me, I was, I was delighted to get into an engineering college. Okay. Uh, I did not know how Nagpur was. I had no clue. I'd never been to Nagpur before. There was no internet. Uh, there was internet, but you know, it was not like, you know, I could see videos and whatnot, right, of the college. So everything was a few photos and whatnot. So I thought, okay, this looks good. 350 acres. Okay, wow. Okay, excellent. Right. So so the key thing is when you come with that kind of a limited this thing. Um, and then you think, okay, internet has come in, everything has come in. Still, there's not a lot of entrepreneurship even now. Then you'll have to go down to the roots of, is there something wrong with Nagpur or the way the students are thinking about their careers there? Are they getting the wrong guidance? Do they have the right role models? What, what would actually kind of push them to actually do great things, right? 
see the key thing is we shouldn't we shouldn't be shitting on ourselves also like the iits have had like a 50 60 year old head start you know in entrepreneurship because you know in the 70s you had a lot of these people going to the us and starting services companies and what not uh, we don't have a lot of these guys we have one or two of these guys have they come and spoken to the students i'm not sure so the key thing is you need to have some of these guys giving back uh, i think money is not the key thing i think the most difficult thing which you'll never get back is time i think we need to contribute some time to this and we need to kind of really put this question into people's heads right like see these days uh, if if you have a roof over your head and see with a with a startup salary of let's say 20000 rupees a month if you can figure out a way to survive in any city and uh, let's say you know you really have a burning idea i think there's no better way to kind of learn life and learn business than actually starting something up even fresh from the college right you might make mistakes you might actually execute on to on to win but it's very important to do that now is there encouragement or is there discouragement is there a culture of encouragement that is something we need to explore i don't think that is there i like look at this see i don't i don't mind that see we have 19 participants it's awesome right but let's say if if ritesh agarwal were speaking from oyo rooms there would be at least 25000 participants right or 20000 participants or whatever participants you wanted right what zoom could handle you would have got that see is that the way to kind of build the ecosystem that is also something we need to think about right so who are the role models that we can get to inspire our vnitians is also like we need to look beyond we need to look beyond our uh, ecosystem also for like people who might inspire these guys the other key thing is uh, i think most people who come to vnit i think their dream is to kind of get a job in let's say google or whatever right whatever they're getting a job to these days right? make some money and you know make some pretty ads for google or some interesting uh, code so that you know the scm is being done right for some company or whatever which is which is not really creating right so will people understand this will people straight out of college be able to build this i think it all comes down to role models and are there role models within vnit there are plenty can we get them yes we can is this enough possibly not do we have to get external role models definitely right how do we build this ecosystem and how do we create this culture of less risk and i think that's the most important thing so i think we need to get into people's minds that this is not necessarily a risk at uh, 21 22 if you kind of start something you spend 3 4 years of your life you would have built the skills that will make you immensely employable all your life and if you can do that uh, see your worst case scenario is a well paid job if your worst case scenario is a well paid job then why not do entrepreneurship from the first place right so i think i think that logic that rational kind of career path has to kind of that flow has to kind of get into people's minds and how we do it i don't have a good answer i think we all need to think think about it. Uh, but i think we shouldn't hit ourselves too hard us you know we have done what we can and, and some of these things cannot be forced some of these things take time and they become organic and over time i think they kind of blossom so that's that thank you that was actually quite insightful so uh I think Lux has a question which he wants to ask. Hey guys, this is the last question. I'll need to head off. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Uh, it's glad uh, to have a conversation with you. So, so I'm a final year student of uh, chemical engineering from VNIT, okay. and in the uh, so I would. Uh, the hostel room looks very nice now. Is that sorry? the hostel room? No, no. Uh, it's <laughs> it's in uh, my home. Yeah, we are doing a college from home right now. Yeah, yes. so uh, so what you talked about is the ecosystem of startups in our college so uh, i have myself worked on three ideas and i have seen my uh, batchmates and my juniors work on different ideas so what i have seen is uh, if i talk about last year there were 25 teams working on different ideas okay. so what i have observed is that we are not able to uh, find out the uh, find out the uh, suitable idea so our ideas are based on uh, a lot of assumptions 
uh, that could be because of lack of guidance or maybe the lack of ex experience or may maybe I haven't worked on that yet. So uh, since you have uh, spent your uh, time in corporate as well, so uh, I think that might have uh, helped you a lot to start your new venture. What right? a question. So the question is, uh, so how, how can we guide the college okay, students? Right. Okay, so do it very quickly, right? See, understand one thing. Uh, this is the most important thing that all engineers need to understand, right? The best engineered product never wins. Okay. I think the ability to sell a product is far more important. Like, for example, can you believe that the iPhone, you couldn't even have widgets till the last iOS update, right? Android had it for like four years or three years now, right? So that's the thing, right? So when you think of engineering and you think from an engineering lens after having been institutionalized in the engineering way of thinking things and solving problems, right? See, engineering is a binary way of thinking, right? See problem, solve problem, right? Do you do it? Yes, no, kind of a thing, right? Flow charts. Life is actually a spectrum. You might be moderately successful. You might be immensely successful. You might be not successful. It doesn't matter. On the spectrum of success, maybe your, pay, your mom thinks you are very successful. It doesn't matter, right? So what is that spectrum? So that is the key thing for you guys to understand. And the way to deconstruct that if I had to kind of put a process to that is very simple, dude. I think first of all, whenever you think of an idea, you need to first eliminate whether it's a BS idea or it's an idea worth pursuing. The way to do it is to sleep over that idea for a week. Even after a week, if you are more excited about the idea than you were before, or at least as excited, not less excited, after a week, then it means you have the drive and the motivation to do that in the first place, right? Once you have done that, the next, second most important thing is to kind of fill up something called the lean startup canvas. Extremely important because see, it kind of takes the business elements of the business and it puts it there. And you guys sit and kind of build that together, right? Once you do these two things, a lot of startups also fail because of the founder issues, right? So it's important that the people you work with are people whom you can trust and kind of you know, scale up as a human also. So these things are all you need to be aware of. Once you have these three ingredients, right, then the magic happens. Now, how do you, so when you do these three things, then you become a little more professional, right? Do I need to handhold you to build a pitch deck? I don't have to, right? Do I need to tell you, oh, you have to build an elevator pitch? You go find it on YouTube, right? So the key thing here is, what level of maturity you can come down to with your idea by asking the same question you have asked. I've demystified it for you a little where I've told you, look, first of all, you, you cannot think in binary terms or life is a spectrum outside of engineering school. It's not a binary choice, number one. If life is a spectrum, then because of business elements, there's a lot of choices which kind of make it spectralized, right? Now, in the business element, how do you build the business effects into an engineering problem, right? because the best engineering engineer products are not necessarily going to win. So then what you need to do is you need to kind of look at, uh, uh, look at a business model canvas. You need to kind of apply some business uh, uh, heuristics or some models uh, or frameworks like the Porter's five forces. Do some basic work to see how will the competitors react? What are the frameworks for how to think about competitors and whatnot? And then once you have done that, then it's important. But I'm assuming that you have slipped over this idea for a week first. Otherwise, dude, everybody, when you're when you're under 40, you get an idea, right? But the key thing is the ideas are cheap. Nobody gives a shit about your idea. Your idea is like BS, right? But whether you can execute that idea or not, that is the most important thing. And this whole packet has to come together. So you have to follow that process, right? What I'm happy to do is see every Saturday, I spend one or two hours for startups. So like anybody who needs my help, they reach out within my network and whatnot. I can definitely set up every Saturday. I can set up an hour or 30 minutes for you guys. If you have some Q and A, if you have, if you want to collect together, you guys want me to kind of help you with a few things, but you guys cannot come to me with basic shit. You need to value my time because honestly, dude, like 
Saturday is work work day for me. Sunday is the only day I get to catch up on sleep, right? So that's that. It's not ego. It's mostly me managing my sleep cycles, right? So you will have to help me out by being super efficient with my time. I'm happy to spare that time every Saturday, the like you know for 54, 56 weeks or whatever that is. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Cool. Anything else? Thank you, Rahul. Uh, I think like uh, we are already. Uh, yeah, uh, we have exceeded time, guys. Yeah, we have exceeded time, and like as as Bithun said, like Saturday is his, you know, key time before he gets onto his sleep mode of tomorrow. So, uh, with that, Bithun, like uh, just just for a couple of minutes, if you are you want to like have some closing remarks or like uh, some key takeaways or any message for the fellow in audience. Nothing, Gupkar. I think I think one of the key questions you asked about how do we build an ecosystem is by doing things like this. What you guys are doing, you and Kartik guys are doing, getting people together. Even if it's 19, 20 people, it doesn't matter. But getting them. Uh, yeah, it's important to have a start. Yeah, so I agree on that. And like. Uh, inception, करना है सबके दिमाग में, है ना? That inception you guys are doing. Right? So I think that is more important, and I think that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so uh, more than anything, like I would uh, like to, you know, thank Karthik for initiating all this because I'm just the guest host for this one session, but uh, Karthik was behind all this. And uh, Mithun, uh, like very very big thanks from all the fellow Indians, you know, for uh, sharing your insights, sharing your experiences and wisdom. And I believe that you know, like these things will go very long way, you know, at least for these 19 people and whoever you know goes through these recordings and whoever gets in touch with you. You know, avoid the mistakes, do the stuff which matters, and be at least somewhere close to what we think about the IITs and the year one institutes as we call it. So, I think simply just follow Nike is just do it. That's all. Just go and do it. Yeah. In the worst case, you'll fall. You'll find a job somewhere. You're a VM IT. It's not yeah. like you can't get a job. Find a job. Go give it a shot. I also want to say hi to Priyanka, who happens to be my tech senior, tech mom. Uh, she's on this call. So hi, hi Priyanka, how are you? Hi Mitun. <laughs> okay, all right. So okay. Mitun, thank you so much. So guys, the only motive behind having this group is to have someone to look up to. You know, uh, as Mitun said that when we were in college, perhaps we did not have the best role models. We don't want that to happen for the current crop of students. Lakshya, if you are still there, I hope you are. Uh, yes, sir. it is. time that you communicated it with your batchmates this is actually very very uh, useful for people who are in the college right now of course we will find a way to reach mithun he happens to be my batchmate and we have a network anyhow but uh, i would be really happy and satisfied if we have 100 students from vnits i think we need to get our uh, uh, you know goals aligned if you are really interested in a startup be it a boxing day or new year's day you know you should be able to join but anyway i don't want to prophesize anything here i want to thank sincerely mithun mithun i really love this no nonsense approach calling bs calling a spade a spade and perhaps that's what makes you a successful on what karthik said mithun absolutely loved it you know like basic things matter and be clear on your basics is something you know like which every entrepreneur should always keep in mind sorry karthik so i i just want to sincerely thank everyone let's build this ecosystem this is not a karthik vyas talk show this is a vnit oh. startup thing karthik is perhaps the shepherd here just that i happened to start the whatsapp group but uh, we would seriously want some more people to join in and uh, please feel free to share this if you know anyone who should be interviewed in this series just let us know i mean uh, the fact that you use the shepherd analogy karthik on boxing day is like uh... Yeah, like, <laughs> started thesis almost. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Bye. <laughs> no okay, thank you so much, guys. Okay, thanks, 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 thank thanks. Thanks, guys. 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 Thanks